Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Um, this text is... This text is uh, pretty well known, right? And I'm sure if you've been around in the church, you've heard this text many times. And to be honest, uh, kind of preparing for this message, um, this text was very difficult for me to kind of digest and think about what can I really share with Stemmers today uh, and, and that we may be able to apply this text into our lives. And uh, I thought about just breaking down verse by verse and taking word by word and try to explain that to you. But instead, I want to focus on the main thing that Jesus wants to take away from this is to become true disciples and make disciples from where we are. Okay, and so today I want to talk about the Great Commission and um, what that really means to us, what it's calling us to do, and what missions is all about. Okay, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, today we will have a send off service, um, send off time for the Albania mission team uh, during announcements. And so um, I kind of want us to have a better perspective of what missions is and what Jesus, the command that Jesus gives here. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. Uh, first thing that we need to understand, as I always mention, is when you read the Word of God, is to read it in context. Okay? To read it in context. You can't just take out this verse and say, well, this is the fa uh, famous verse that everyone knows. Uh, we do it through retreat memory verses and things like that. You might have heard it. Uh, but we need to think about what Jesus, what's happening here that Jesus is saying these words. And so to kind of give you a brief background is what was happening is this is the last chapter of the Gospel of, of Matthew where Jesus has already, right before this chapter, has died on the cross and resurrected and has come before the disciples in a smaller setting and they spent time together. And now Jesus is saying, come to this mountain that I want you, you guys to come and I will meet you there. Okay? This is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so um, if you look at verse 16 and 17, it says they came, went up to the mountain and some of them were able to worship him saying, wow, this is really God, you know, God, Jesus Christ in the flesh. He has come back from the dead. And some of them kind of had a difficult time still doubting, is this really Jesus? Okay? And then Jesus gathers them all together, whether they're doubting or worshiping, and says this, gives this commandment. And so when you see the first words that we read today in verse 18, then Jesus came to them, right? So this is a very shocking moment to really think about it. Someone they, they knew that died on the cross a couple of days ago came back to life and appeared before them, right? I mean, think about that. How freaky would that be if uh, my, my grandfather, he passed away like about 10 years ago and all of a sudden I'm like going home and I see my grandfather sitting on the couch. It's like, what the, what is going on, right? You'd be freaking out. And so think about the, the, where the mentality of the disciples might be, right? They spent three and a half years every single day with Jesus and doing ministry and following after him and, and, and living the life together and he died on the cross and they're filled with sorrow and didn't have any direction of life. And then Jesus comes back to life and he's calling them. And he's the one who comes before them and says, here, I want to give you this commandment for you to really go out and follow. Right? How freaky that must have been. And so here Jesus says, he gives them a commandment saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that he has defeated death, he has this authority and he's giving his word on behalf of Jesus Christ and on, on behalf of as God himself and gives the word to go and make disciples of all nations. Right? It's not just he's asking, guys, can you guys do me a favor and try to you know, live this kind of a way? No, it's, he's giving a very direct command to the disciples. And so um, today, I'll, like I mentioned, I'll be talking about the importance of missions, what missions is about, and what, how we can really begin to uh, live with the mission mindset. Okay? Um, so to kind of ask you a question, did you ever think about what your life's goal is? Okay, what is your life goal as a Christian? Okay, a lot of people in this world who don't know Jesus Christ, their life goal is to 
uh, you know, get into the best school so that you have the best chance of getting into a college and getting a good job and living comfortable, make, making a lot of money, having a name for yourself, becoming the CEO of a company and things like that and, and being able to establish yourself, making a name so that you can live comfortably. A lot of people who do not know Jesus Christ, this is their only goal and you die when time comes, right? And this is what life is all about. But on the other hand, for us Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, that's not what all life is all about, right? We understand that we are sinners. And because of we live in sin, we, we, you know, God can't even look at us. We look so filthy and disgusting. But in his love for us, he sends his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us upon the cross and says, I want to have a, a daily relationship with the son, this daughter that is my creation. And through Jesus Christ, of us believing in him and him shedding the blood upon the cross, we're able to have this access to, to God, right? And that's the, that's the thing that we have when we come into the presence of God. We're not just singing and listening and, and worshiping at this time to someone that's as far out there who doesn't really care anything about us, but who is a God who wants to interact with us, who wants to come and meet with us and get to know what's really going on upon our lives and, and walk with us every single moment. And this is what God really wants us to do. And so, and so our goal becomes, how can I then live a life that really please not my own self, but please God? And that becomes our goal. Now think about it for your life after becoming a follower of Christ, after the moment where you experience that you are a sinner before the Lord and that he has given you this love upon the cross and given you this grace and opportunity for you to live your life, how your life has changed, right? Are you living a life with that type of a mindset saying, I need to live for Christ, not only for myself, but I am living my life for Christ. He has paid a great price for me by shedding his blood upon the cross so that I can live. And that my goal, my life's goal, is to go out and be able to represent Christ. How well are you representing Christ in your life, in your school setting, in your hagwan, wherever you go, at home, you know, in your actions, in your speech? Do you really have the fragrance of Christ as Paul talks about? Do you really act on behalf of Christ thinking that Christ is living in you? Or are you still with the same mindset thinking, well, that's for me to do on Sundays? As long as I do that when I go to church and, and the pastor and the, and the teacher see me of how I am, I think it's okay, right? I mean, we can't be satisfied with that. That's not what Jesus is really calling us to live, right? He's giving us this command and saying, this is your life's goal, right? It's to really represent me. I'm, I won't be here. I will be ascending into heaven now. And now your job for you to do is go out into the world and represent me to the best as you can. And he gives a promise at the end. He says, until the very end of the age, and I will always be with you. Right? He gives that assurance of promise and hope that he doesn't leave us to live this life uh, on our own, but he's with us every single moment. Right? So this has to just be established, that our goal has to be not just to live a life comfortably. I mean, that's good too. I'm not saying there's anything wrong or bad in that. But do we still live as every, everyone else is living for the rest of the world? Or do we have a different mindset knowing that this world is not our home, that we're here to really represent Christ as best of our abilities so that God may be pleased and that has to be our goal. Do we live in this type of a manner, right? And so Christ, Christ as he, before he ascends into heaven, he's giving this command saying, your job is to go and represent me as best as you can and make disciples of all nations. Right? Be of influence, right? I mean, don't we all want to be of influence in life, right? No one wants to live a life without any, having any influence in the world, in the people that we, that we meet and things like that, right? We feel like our life is becoming like useless if we don't have any type of impact or any influence towards other people. So in that mindset, are we really living a life of being of influence, of knowing who Christ is upon our lives and relaying that so that others may too know the heart of God in this way, okay? So with that, Christ gives this command to go out and become disciples of all nations and make disciples, okay? So what is this calling? And we think about missions, okay? Um, I did share my testimony a lot. I feel like a lot, but in case you haven't heard, um, I grew up as a pastor's kid, right? 
I'm gonna keep it short. I know it's very repetitive for some of you, and heard of you, some of you heard it so many times. I grew up as a pastor's kid. My father is the oldest of six kids, and he became a pastor, and all his brothers became pastors. My mom said they're either married to pastors or missionaries, and so I always, ever since growing up, I said I had one prayer in mind: God. Don't make me a pastor. I'll do anything else. I'll be, you know, a garbage man. I'll do not. I'm, I don't have anything against garbage man, but I'll like anything that people may don't want to take upon. I'll do anything but become a pastor. But more than that, one other prayer that I had secretly in my mind was, God, more than a pastor, don't ever make me a missionary. Okay, that was one thing that I really held on to because when growing up, when you think about missionaries, what comes to mind? I don't know about you, but. The picture that I get is people sacri making sacrifices about their life and going into African jungle and like they don't have access to housing and bathrooms and food. Like you have to, you know, carve off barks of trees, like like crazy stuff. And I'm like, I'm not fit for that, right? I can't serve. I won't be able to survive. And missions is so far from me, God. It's so scary. And 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 I was so I was so afraid to really fully commit my life to God because of this. How foolish is that, right? Because when I was growing up, there was a lot of, of like, um, like lectures that people have experienced the Holy Spirit, right? And it was very scary thing. When I remember specifically when I was like around seven years old, uh, my mom gave me this cassette tape, right? I won't get into that again, but something that you can listen to, play like and listen to. And in that, it was like testimonies about like these twin, th th these eight-year-old twin brothers who received the spirit and they experienced like seeing heaven and hell and I was I was so freaked out and I was like God I don't want to get too close to you because I don't want to experience all this and I don't want to be able to see any of that and uh, it's gonna freak me out I can't sleep and I can't really commit my life to you and what if you call me to Africa and I can't live my life fully like I became so afraid okay but we have to kind of change that mindset if you're in that shoe Thinking about missions is about going into these hardships and, and experiencing all the difficulties of life. We need to kind of have a right perspective, okay? And that's where I kind of want to start off, right? Um, it's important, missions is so important, right? Thinking about Korea, right? And I was looking this up and, and, and so interested to see because there was huge mega churches in Korea and so many people, Koreans are, are Christians and about like 40% of the nation is Christians, right? Such a huge population that's committed to Christ. And I'm thinking, well, how did all this start? Okay, how did all this start? And I looked it up online and there's this, there's this one man, Robert Germain Thomas, okay? His middle name is Germain. Anyway, Robert Germain Thomas, in 1865, um, he, he kind of, he committed his life to Christ. He's from England, he committed his life to Christ, and, and he, was, he had a heart for China, right? And so uh, he went to China as a missionary to wanna, wanting to share the gospel with the people there. And somehow one thing led to another. From China, he was led into Korea, right? But all he had was Chinese tracts and Chinese Bibles. And so he was like, oh, Asians. And he decided to give them, Koreans, Chinese tracts and Chinese Bibles, right? I mean, imagine like you're walking down the street and this, this non-Korean comes up to you and says, oh, believe in Jesus Christ and gives you a tract that you, don't, you can't even read and understand. It's like, huh? Like, what's this guy doing? He thinks I'm Chinese. Are you offending me? And like start fighting. Um, but that's what he was doing, right? And think about that. And that's how he started. And so somehow he got into Korea and for two months, he kind of interacted with the people there, started to try to learn, made the attempts to learn the language and try to understand the culture and the people of Korea. Time passed where he was sent back to the States and he had the opportunity to come through with the army, okay? And as they were coming through the ships, um, Koreans were kind of battling with them and they didn't want them off the boat. Okay, and so they were throwing like um, shooting and, and things like that. And in this situation, um, he got his head cut off, right? In this battle, in this attack. One interesting thing is the person who killed him, um, he had the opportunity to before, prior to. So this, this, this was like not just one time setting where he got killed right away, but he was on the boat, he came on shore and tried to interact with the people, but he, they didn't want him, so they tried to send him back. And so, um, what happened was the person who ended up killing him, he received a Bible from Robert, okay? And he remembers that and, and people 
Koreans back then used the Bible to kind of make cigarettes and smoke and, and use for other things, right? Because they don't know what the Bible is. And so um, it came to a point where he wanted to wallpaper his house, right? Kind of do some interior designing. And so he started ripping out all the Bibles and starts plastering them all over his house, right? Uh, and so what happened was he had all the Bible verses all over, not like he wanted to read it, but he used it for wallpaper purposes. And people will come and read the word of God this way. And through this, a church was started. And this is how Christianity started in Korea, right? Through one man's sacrifice, he, want, he had the heart to really share the word of God, realizing, man, God loves me, a sinner like myself, Man, I need to share this word of God with other people. And so he went into a country where he can't even speak the language, doesn't know the culture, but he goes by faith and wanting, wants to share the word of God with these people. And because through that one man and his life, that he, the life, devoted life that he lived for missions, this country has come to be known as people with Christians, right? Becoming to know God through one person. So missions... Um, I think mission, we need to, the importance of it is through one person, it can reach so many people, right? Um, there's also a famous missionary, Jim Elliot, right? I know a lot of you have heard of it. Jim Elliot, he had a heart for the Ecuadorians, right? And people who were known to kill people and eat them. And, but he had this heart for these people. He went and he couldn't even go near to that place. So from helicopters, they would kind of throw Bibles and, and make announcements, right? And so he had the opportunity to go near, near the tribe that he wanted to reach next to it. And people, they kind of opened up and wanting to kind of kill him and, and I don't know. And um, they led him into their village and he was captured and killed. But it's through his sacrifice that he made of being committed, wanting to share the word of God, that that tribe leader was able to know God. Right? Through one person. So we see the importance of missions is that one person of how they acted, focusing their eyes, fixing their eyes on the goal of life is to really represent Christ, to make the gospel known no matter what, no matter what it takes. And it's through those sacrifices of those people that we have the word of God, right? We might be, we, we have it so good. We're sitting in this room in chairs and AC and, and, you know, we have the Bible physically in our hands. But back then, there's so many people out there can't even get a hold of a Bible. They want to read it, but they don't have the book in itself. And so sometimes they have to share it with the village people, one Bible. And yet we have multiple Bibles at home where we just use it at, on a, you know, leave it on a bookshelf collecting dust, you know, hold down paper when the wind blows or whatever, right? We don't really take advantage of reading God's word. We take everything so for granted, right? We need to think about, uh, am I really living a life to really represent God? Do I really love God and his word and how it's gotten to me? Do I really appreciate that, okay? And so we see through one person, it can affect a whole village. It can affect the whole town, a city, right? I mean, these people weren't just like really scholars and, and people who are, you know, very knowledgeable about the word of God. They just loved God. That's what they had, a heart to really share the word of God with the people, you know? And for many of us, we might be thinking, well, I, that's not me, right? I can't be a missionary. I don't know anything. I can't share the gospel. I can't share the Bible with people around me. I don't know anything. I don't know enough. I'm not equipped. I'm not prepared. You know, God doesn't say, okay, now you're fully ready to share the word of God with people. God doesn't do that, right? We need to have a heart of God, of what Christ has done for me and how we can share that with the people around us, right? And so in the same way, you know, this is a command that's given to the disciples and all the followers of Jesus Christ, not just the selected few, not just the pastors and the missionaries' job. It's everyone's job followers of Christ for us to really um, take the word and, and share it with the people around us, okay? So we need to have that mindset, fix our eyes, having the goal to really represent Christ, have a different perspective about missions that through one person, it can affect the whole town, city, village, whatever, right? Okay, we, it has that type of power that God can come and use. So then we see these things, how can then we do missions, okay? Um, like I mentioned before, all of us are called into the mission field. Now, I'm not talking about just other countries. Yeah, 
that can, missions can be in other countries, other cities, but missions simply can be with our surroundings, okay? When you go to school, you can be the missionary in, your, in that setting. Are there people around you that do not know Christ, okay? Now, I'm not saying we need to go up to them with Bible in hand and be like, hey, do you know what the Bible says? And you need to believe and sit them down and you can't leave until you believe and give me that, like, that's not the way to do it, right? I mean, God is calling us to live the life in our daily setting by how we act and how we, how we speak to one another, right? Like all these things, I think actions speak so much louder than words. We think evangelism and missions and trying to share the gospel, it has to only come through just talking, but it's not. Why did then Jesus spend three and a half years with his disciples if he can just simply say, hey, go out and do this and these are my words, just keep them, right? He interacted with these people. He, he showed them how to really live a life that is glorifying to the Lord. And so this is what God is calling us as missionaries and to the mission field that we're in, in the school place. Maybe at home, you have parents or family members that do not know Christ. It's our calling, it's our job to really represent Christ as the best of our ability so that he may be pleased, okay? The way we live, the way we act, the way we treat other people, the way we share love with other people, okay? I think these are better ways that we can contextualize and to be able to be of influence to the people around us. And, and so that mindset has to be there, that all of us are called in our settings. But also missions is about, it's either one of two things. It's either people going or people sending, right? Um, beyond the, the context of where we are, God specifically places countries or people upon our hearts that we go to other places where we don't know the language, uh, where we don't know the culture, but we share the love of Jesus Christ with them, okay? Like for instance, we have mission team that's going to Albania. Like think about, do you ever think about that? Like how difficult it might be? Like the training and the preparation, thinking about the people there, you don't know the language, you know? It's like, if you look at it from their perspective, like all these foreign people that you don't even, can't even interact with the same language, you're sitting there and they come to you and all of a sudden they're really sharing the love of Jesus Christ with you. They're really nice to you and they're like, um, you know, sharing, you know, the word of God and just living this kind of a way. How freaked out would you be, right? But thinking about it, they make efforts of learning the language, the culture, and trying to see the importance of sharing the gospel. They come and uh, and people do that, right? People of missions go out into other countries and other cities with this mindset. Um, so how to do missions is, uh, it's either you are a sender, you are sending, or you're actually going. And I had the opportunity to participate in both, okay? And as a, a person who goes, I had um, a lot of opportunities to go on mission trips. Like, like I mentioned before, I always pray not to be a missionary. And so missions wasn't very open for me. I didn't really understand what Jesus was calling people, his people to do in this text, where I always had the mindset saying, well, only missionaries and pastors and, and those type of people should go on missions. And I, I didn't really take this to heart of a commandment that God, Jesus was giving to me personally. Um, but through my parents' influence, I had the opportunity to go on missions. and. You know, in the mission field, as a person who goes, right, you're going and sharing the word of God. But on the other side, as a person who is sending, if you're not going, you're a sender, okay? What, what your job is to do is to support them, not just financially. I mean, if you're able, that'd be great. But number one thing I think that's important is prayer, right? I think in the bulletins, with the bulletins, you guys have the Albania pr team prayer cards, right? I mean, don't just look at this and look at the pictures, how huh? they look nice and just throw it out. Um, look, read the contents of the prayer. As a sender, all of us are senders who are not going. Pray for them. You know, I experienced the importance of other people interceding and praying for our team when I had the opportunity to go to Russia, right? I went with my college group and I was there for two weeks and Russia was a very difficult country to share the gospel with, right? There was a lot of government restrictions and a lot of the police and the army people were very corrupt where it's so easy for you to just get by with just giving them money, just bribing them, right? And so um, 
it was very difficult. And I remember as soon as we got there, 30 of us went, half of our, we went to a domestic airport and half of our airplane tickets that we reserved were sold to someone else. And we're like, what? What do we do? <laughs> um, and so, of course, I was the part of the group that was left behind. And uh, we spent the night in a hostel. Okay. Now, I don't know what comes to mind when you think of a hostel. Maybe like you've seen in movies where it's like a broken down, like a, a place of like a motel and like red lights and very freaky looking. That's exactly what it was for me, right? Um, we went and it was red lights and all these people were like very intimidating looking and you know, they were like staring at us like these Asians, right? And, and we were so scared, we didn't even look anywhere. We just went to our room and we just prayed all night. We're like, God, save my life. Lord, this is why I didn't want to go on missions, right? And, um, you know, like 15 of us, we were praying we, all throughout the night and nothing happened to us. Thank God for that. And next day, we were able to go on um, to our destination where our missionary was meeting us. And so he greeted us at the domestic airport and he's like, oh, I'll take care of you guys. And he had his car and he rented out a van for the rest of us. And um, he decided to take all our luggages in his car and along with it, all our passports. And so what happened was when, when we were at the airport, the soldiers, these soldiers came to us and said, where are you guys going? We're like, oh, we're going to this city, right? And so what they do is, I told you, these, some of these cops were very corrupt and they would call the, the checkpoints in advance and say, hey, these foreigners are coming. Try to take money off of them or something like that. And so we were just driving by and the missionary, you know, with, a, with all of our passports and our luggage was driving right in front of us and he was kind of, I guess, enjoying the speed. It was a nice day and he goes off and, and as we were going, we get to the checkpoint and we see like 10 soldiers with like these machine guns. We're like, oh God, what's happening? They stop us and they're like, where's your passport? We're like, where is our passport? And we don't have any phone. We have no way to contact the missionary. And he's left, right? He was leading us, but he's left, right? Um, I guess he had to go somewhere. And um, we were waiting and everyone, he's like, the soldiers came, they're like, everyone out of the car. Um, I think that's what they said, because we didn't speak Russian. They're like, like this. And so we were outside with our bags and, and we were held at gunpoint. We were so scared and in, in that moment, for an hour and a half that we were waiting for the missionary to come back, we were praying so hard, right? And, you know, when we came back, we shared this testimony of, of our experience with the church. And before we went, we asked them to pray. And they were saying, you know, in that specific time, they were praying for us. The word got out from the missionary and they, he contacted the church and people gathered together in the church and they prayed for us. You know, I mean, I think there's true power in prayer. Even if you don't go, it's not like, well, those people should go and, and do missions and praise God, you know, thank, for, thank God for them. You know, they'll be able to represent our church, our ministry and do their thing and not just leave it there. But our job here as senders is to really intercede and pray for them, okay? And there is true power in that. God uses, listens to those prayers and strengthens the team, Amen. Right? So don't overlook this. Don't overlook how God really works. Right? Our job is to really intercede and pray on their behalf. Right? And you know, as senders, this is our calling. This is our job. Why? Because God says, Jesus says here, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples. If we are not the people that are not going, then we ought to really pray and intercede and do our parts. Okay? And so um, the cards that you have, uh, stick that into your Bibles and pray. Pray for the mission team. I know it's only short-term missions of two weeks, and you might be thinking, what can God do in two weeks? Oh, God can do anything in two hours or, you know, two minutes, right? He's God. And so every day, set up a time to go over the prayer list and specifically pray for them, intercede, and we'll be able to see and witness and hear about how God has been working uh, mighty things through this team uh, when they come back, and I'm sure they will. They will. Uh, okay. And so um, another thing that I want to mention is like thinking about going and sending, right? I thought about people who are very dedicated to missions is Mormons. Do you guys know Mormons? Right? If you go out on the streets, these are two people by twos. They wear a shirt and tie looking all nice and, and they walk around and, and they share their faith with people. Now, I, I kind of looked upon 
why they do this, right? Why do they go into a foreign country and, and annoy people? I mean, um, share, try to, uh, we might look at it as annoyance, but they share, they, they have their mission set. And, think, and looking upon more detail about their lives, when they're young, they, have, they pick a country, right? They pick a country and they start learning that language. They think about missions. They have this missional mindset. They learn the language until they're fluent and they work. They have, you know, maybe allowance or they make the effort to work and save money. So for two years, they dedicate their lives for this mission work. And not only any years, but they think they believe in giving their prime ears, the best ears of their lifetime. So about like 23 to 25 or something like that. They give, they dedicate those two years to the mission field. I mean, these are, you know, they, they have a different view about Jesus Christ and what the Bible says, right? Um, and they don't fully really believe in the gospel. And we see people like this going out and making sacrifices and planning far beyond, right? when they were young, picking a country, praying for a country, and, and, and dedicating their lives in this way. But yet, what are we doing? Right? When Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's so much work to be done. There's so many people out there who do not know Jesus Christ and dying each day without knowing the love of Jesus Christ, of what God has done for them. And yet, we sit here so comfortably, uh, someone will do it. That's someone else's job it doesn't really have any effect upon us. As followers of Christ, we need to really think about this. If it's not really affecting you in this way, right? Because if we can't even do something like they're dedicating their whole, the prime years of their life, I mean, think about that. Would you be able to do that, right? Would you be able to learn the language of another culture and prepare yourself in this way and give your best prime years of your life as dedication to serving Christ in that foreign land. It's not an easy thing to do, but they do it because they have their own way of thinking uh, with that mindset. I think we need to recognize that it's urgent that people, yes, people are dying left and right without knowing Jesus Christ, and it should have an effect upon you, upon your heart. And so if you're not a goer, we should be a sender. And that's part of the reason why we do compassion. Right? Not because we just want money from you and, and do that, but through giving money, right? through giving our prayers and sending these letters and cards, um, being dedicated in this way, in turn, they would know, come to know Jesus Christ and that one person can influence their whole town, their city. Right? I mean, God has the potential to do that and that's why we, we serve them in this way. And so we kind of also at the same time need to have a better right mindset when it comes to compassion giving. That we don't just say, oh, well, I have some le money left over, here it is. But kind of doing it prayerfully, thinking about the student that we are supporting and praying, saying, God, use this girl, use this boy. I know they're young, but Lord, help them to receive the gospel upon their heart so that they too may be able to grow up under you and be able to influence their settings, right? All these things that we need to really consider about talking about missions, if we're not goers, we are senders, but more importantly, all of us are missionaries in our own mission field, okay? So think about how you can be of influence in your schools, at your homes, in your, amongst your friends. Am I really representing Christ? Do I have that as my goal to really be of influence for Christ in my life? Or am I, am I, my goal is just living my, my life for myself and just being happy with it, okay? Let's have a different perspective of one, what God is commanding here and calling us to do, that we may really live our lives to really represent Him and to really support the work that He wants to accomplish, that all people of all nations may come to know Jesus Christ. And until that day, it is our calling to really pray for these people, for the nations, and to really support as much as we can, you know? If not financially, other ways. I mean, it doesn't always have to be financial. Prayers are things that you can really commit to and do all the time without costing anything, right? Without costing money. And so um, let's be able to have that type of a mindset that this great commission is given to each and every one of us, that it's our job to do 
and that we may take it seriously to really represent Christ in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for reminding us once again, Lord, the command that you have given each and every one of us as followers of Christ is to go out into the world and to represent you. And, and you, your heart, just not just leaving us out there on our own, but the promise that you give us is that you will be with us always till the end of the age. Lord, help us to have that true confidence and be able to live our lives every moment, Lord, any setting that you have placed us in, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, amongst our friends, to really shine your light upon our hearts in this world, Lord. To really become the salt and light that is separated, to really honor you. So Lord, we ask that you may come and strengthen us. And at the same time, Lord, help us to really intercede and pray for the teams that are going out, Lord. That it may just not be an experience of a trip that they have, but Lord, it may be a life-changing, life-transforming experience where you may work through each and every single member to really reach the people, to really reach the lost, Lord. Help us to do our part, Lord, to the best of our abilities, Lord. We thank you for your word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.